All right, folks. So um, this is the unit on um, kinetics. And kinetics is mostly about reaction rates. And I want to spend this video kind of going through these notes with you. Um, but before we kind of dive in, I just want to talk about reaction rates and just some just some key pieces of information. This unit is awesome. There's really not that much to it in a lot of ways. Um, and it's a little bit disconnected from all the other units. There's some minor connections, but it's kind of weirdly independent. Um, but there's a lot, it's very circular. So like an Ouroboros, like a snake eating its own tail. Um, it's, um, there's a lot, yeah, it's a lot of concepts that are all tied together. So I wanna go through these notes with you and um, we'll end up backtracking a lot and hopefully by the end, it will sort of make sense. And then we can just kind of keep plotting along and uh, filling in all the gaps and making it all make sense. So I just wrote this up just as like, um, just when I was planning this out. Um, some key facts to know, so just some, some key ideas to keep in your head during this whole thing, if at all possible. So first of all, the rate of reaction um, is kind of an obvious concept, I think, in a lot of ways. It's like how quickly a reaction is occurring. Um, and it's a whole field of study, this whole idea of kinetics and reaction rates. So it is determined by the concentration of reactants. The products don't matter because it's really just um, like once the products are made, they're just kind of sitting there in terms of the reaction. Um, but the concentration of reactions definitely does matter. Um, the temperature of the reaction also is very important. So the higher the temperature, generally speaking, the faster the reaction is going to go. Um, another really big part of this is um, the rate of the reaction. Uh, so these are two variables that we could change when it comes to a reaction. So if we have something, some reaction that's happening, we use the word reaction a lot. Uh, if we have a reaction that's occurring, we can alter the concentration of reactants and the uh, temperature. The mechanism we can't, but the mechanism is also what helps determine how fast a reaction happens. Some mechanisms are fairly simple and quick, so they happen quickly. Others are more complicated. Um, that is a job that like some chemists have, which is trying to figure out the mechanisms. There's a whole bunch of ways of doing that that are way beyond the scope of this class, but pretty cool just to know about in general. Um, one of the biggest details, I'm gonna circle this one because it's freaking important. It's just that crazily important is that details, everything about this must be determined by experimentation. So by details, I guess what I mean here is um, the mechanism um, is proposed based on um, experimental data. The exact relationship, so these are some details. The exact details, um, the, sorry, the relationship between the rate and the reactants is determined through experiments. And then you can take um, uh, that relationship that you kind of figured out, that mathematical relationship and propose some sort of mechanism, but it has to be all based on experimental data. So you can't just look at a chemical equation and know anything about the rate. You have to do experiments. That is one of the biggest misconceptions for this unit. Um, and I will show you some examples of that. Um, the rate itself um, is, it's kind of like speed, like distance, you know, speed is distance over time. Um, in this case, it's the concentration, the change of the concentration um, of either the reactants or products over the change in time. So there are three factors, rate, concentration, and time, rate, time, and concentration that this whole unit is concerned with. When it comes to those three variables, um, there's different ways of looking at them. Um, when we talk about the mathematical relationships, we're usually concerned with two out of three. So um, there's two different ways of kind of mathematically expressing um, uh, rates. It's called a rate law, which we'll get into for sure. Um, one of them compares concentration and time, and the other one compares rate and concentration. So two out of three, but they're all really related to this idea of rate. Um, this is also a unit where if you know calculus, um, you could dive into this a lot more, but you don't have to know calculus for this. So there you go. Sorry, I just remembered I have to do something. Okay, now we're good. I don't know if you guys can see that, whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay, so there's three big ideas that are gonna happen and they're all connected to each other. 
we've got a rate law, a mechanism, and order of reactants. So all three of these kind of feed into each other, which again is like that circular or ouroboric nature of um, this unit. So um, the rate law is a mathematical equation that, expect, that expresses how the reactants um, affect the rate. A rate law is written for a specific temperature. Um, if you change the temperature, it can still work, but you have to alter parts of it, which we'll get into also. Um, the rate law is connected to the mechanism. So it's an explanation and like details of exactly how a reaction really occurs. Um, when you see a chemical equation, that is a summary, not the whole deal. Finally, we have the order of reactants. And by finally, I mean, this is the most important. This is the actual relationship, the type of mathematical effect a reactant has on the rate. Um, you cannot write a rate law. You cannot understand the rate law without the order of reactants. And the mechanism must support the order, the experimentally determined order of reactants. So this is kind of like a, um, more like an end of unit, almost like an end of unit summary of just like stuff that you should understand. But I wanted to give it to you now just to give you uh, a place to start. So I think it's time to just dive right in. Um, I'm using the paper notes just so I can draw on them, but obviously if you have them on your computer, it's gonna be a little more legible. And um, I will try to make this all make sense. Um, here's the plan. I wanna go through this whole thing with you here. I'm gonna not fill in everything. There's some extra examples that we'll go through in class. And then um, there's also an example on the back that we're gonna go through in class. Um, this example is going to take us through everything, every possible type of question that I can answer, per, ask you pretty much. Um, but let's just get started, dig right in. Okay, so reaction rates, again, like we said, are the change in concentration or of products over time. Um, the ins uh, so let's actually take a look at, let's take a look at this one. This is a good reaction. These are two reactions that we're gonna be um, using as examples throughout this whole unit. It's a little confusing because they're both combinations of nitrogen and oxygen, but you know, welcome to chemistry. So um, if we wanted to draw a graph that shows, we've got time on the bottom, probably in seconds, and let's do react, reactant, concentration. Okay. So remember the square brackets is molarity. So I'll write that in here. Big M parentheses. That's the units. Okay. So if we want to show um, the what like what happens over time to this reaction, um, we can uh, we can do that. So looking at the um, the the molar ratios of this equation, uh, let's just say we start off with, I'm going to pick out three colors that I think will show up nicely. I think the blue is going to be pretty good. I think this orange will work. And then maybe this green, no, it might not be, let's see, I'm trying to pick out a good color. Maybe this purple. Okay, we'll try these. So I'm going to have um, this blue represent the nitrogen, um, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide. So Let's just say it, its concentration starts here at the very beginning of the reaction. Um, at the very beginning of the reaction, we also are not going to expect to have any um, of the nitrogen dioxide or oxygen because those are our products. So what we want to think about here is um, what is going to happen over time to the concentration. So. Um, this is the, the reactant. So what we'd expect over time is that we're going to start with a higher concentration and it's probably all going to get used up. So by the end, we would have none left. So, or maybe not much left. Um, so um, if I were to draw like a, a graph to represent this, oops, there goes lights. This is going to happen a couple times. It's supposed to be a fire alarm too. Hopefully I'll finish before that goes off. Okay, so um, I would expect over time we get something like that. So this is the um, this is the N2O5. So we start off with a bunch and it all goes away. How about um, the um, the nitrogen dioxide and the oxygen? So if the nitrogen dioxide 
Um, the nitrogen dioxide has, uh, in terms of stoichia, uh, in terms of the, the molar ratios, we would expect this to start appearing. Um, based on the ratios here, it looks like it's going to appear about twice as fast as um, the uh, nitrog dinitrogen pentoxide is disappearing. So um, it might be something like this, and we're going to get end up with quite a, a very high concentration. Um, and my graph, I did a very bad job of drawing this graph. I should have brought that down. I'll just do it. I'll move it down a little bit. That's better. I'll erase that. Ignore that. Okay, so something more like this. It's going to decrease. Okay, so the final concentration of this is going to be twice as high. So we'll make that up here. So it might be something like this. And that's the NO2. So the, um, the molar ratios of this reaction actually can tell us something very interesting. Okay, and finally, we've got the oxygen. The oxygen is going to appear, um, the final concentration is going to be like a quarter of what the concentration of the um, nitrogen um, dioxide is going to be. And it's going to be about half of the starting concentration of the um, dinitrogen pentoxide. So it's still going to appear and start from nothing, but it's probably going to end up like like that. And that's the O2. Okay. So um, this is kind of a nice little graph just to start thinking about what's actually happening. So taking, um, um, like making a graph visual to explain what's happening in this reaction over time. Um, once you start drawing these straight lines, it's just showing that the concentration isn't changing. So you're probably at the end of the reaction. So this might be like the midpoint of the reaction, maybe here-ish, and then the end is kind of in here. All right. So the instantaneous rate is the rate that the reaction is happening at any given, at a specific moment in time. So if we wanted to measure the rate of this reaction at a very specific time, um, uh, we could pick a point, maybe here, and then all we got to do is get the slope of the tangent. So if, as you guys know, that's rise over run. So uh, the slope of a line is going to be the um, change in the concentration of reactants divided by the change in time. And that's slope, according to this graph. So um, that indeed looks like a rate to me. Um, it's very much like, um, um, yeah, like a, like a speed, you know, distance over time. Same idea. All right, so that's right. Um, useful stuff. Um, let's talk about uh, about what's actually happening on a chemical level. So the next section here is about modeling, um, like what's actually going on. So uh, the rate is determined by um, collisions and the exact mechanism of those collisions. So I have a little diagram here. In the collision mo mo model, the idea is for a reaction to occur, molecules or atoms have to hit each other with enough speed and in the correct orientation. Those are the two um, uh, factors, force of collision, position of molecules in order for a reaction to occur. So this diagram here shows you um, this idea of collisions. So um, they have to be in the correct orientation. So these two are examples where a it's the incorrect or ineffective collision, where they just kind of tap each other and bounce off um, based on orientation. This is the correct orientation and the only way for this reaction to actually occur. Um, the, the more difficult it is for those molecules to be in the correct orientation, the slower the reaction is going to take. So for example, if you have two individual fluorine atoms, they're basically like billiard balls, they're little spheres. So it doesn't really matter how they hit each other. The orientation is identical. This example, um, there's lots of different ways that they can um, orient themselves. So for example, it's hard, kind of hard to see in this one. One of them is nitrogen, then oxide, oxygen. The other one's oxygen, then nitrogen. Either way, this is not the correct orientation. Um, yeah, which this one is. So the more complicated the shapes are, the more, the trickier it is to get them to collide. The next thing is force. So if the molecules are, or the chemical species aren't moving fast enough, they'll just tap each other and won't 
the actual reaction won't occur. Um, so that is like the force. So any factors that will increase the chances of the of the uh, the chemicals uh, chemical species or the molecules or atoms hitting each other. One second. Um, is going to increase the rate of the reaction. Those two factors, generally speaking, are um, temperature and concentration. So if you increase the concentration of the reactants, you know, there's just more of them bouncing around, more likely to hit each other. If you increase the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy, um, which is both the force that they can hit each other, but also um, it increases like their rotation. So that they're wiggling around a lot more. There's just more movement um, and physically everything's gonna collide much more often. Um, think back to kinetic molecular theory back in gas laws. It's the same basic idea. Hey, we're in a kinetics unit. It's about kinetic molecular theory. Who would have thought? Okay, so there's that. Um, so important factors to kind of think about when you're kind of conceptualizing uh, reaction rates. Um, the next thing to talk about then is um, the progress of a reaction. So we usually think about reactions in terms of the reactants and products. So like, for example, we've got this little model down here. We've got reactants and products. But in reality, there's more steps involved. Stuff has to happen to the reactants, often multiple steps of things. Um, so we're not really seeing that middle stage. So um, the there's, yeah, we can kind of focus in, let's focus in on this example for just a second, and then we can kind of go back to all this other stuff. We'll zoom in a bit so we can actually see things. So this is a diagram. It's called um, an energy diagram. Oops, energy diagrams. Uh, they have other names too, but that's one of the things I like to call them anyway. Um, and it shows the potential energy based on the progress of the reaction. So this is the start of the reaction. This is the end. So we've got our reactants and our products. So the carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide are right there. And our products are carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. So in between those two steps is the mechanism or the actual reaction, like what's really happening. Um, in this particular case, we, we, it, it looks kind of like this. There's some sort of little drawing here. Um, it might be more than one step. This is showing only one step, but frequently you have multiple steps. Um, but either way, this is the transition state, also known as the activated complex. Um, and it's what like happens to make the reaction actually occur. Um, some sort of transitional or intermediate phase. Um, in terms of potential energy, um, your react the reactants have a certain amount of potential energy. Um, we usually refer to this, I usually think of it in terms of, it's, it's, it's a simplification and it's not 100% accurate, but it works well enough. The energy, the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds, it's like the chemical potential energy. In the, in, in the course of the reaction, um, it takes some extra energy, like potential energy, um, to make this transition occur. Um, and that is something we call activation energy. So activation energy, energy needed for the collisions to occur and reaction to proceed. So in this graph, we show that the activation energy is usually higher than just the base state of the, of the reactants. So you gotta add some energy to actually make this, this transition state occur. The transition state is usually less stable than the reactants or the products. Um, the reactants and products are definitely more stable. Um, so this transition state just has to, you have to have enough energy to force it to occur and then the reaction will proceed. So um, in this graph, that re the activation energy is represented by the difference between the energy of the reactants and that transition state. So that's what this little hump represents. Okay, so that's EA, activation energy, or energy of activation. Um, yeah, so there's that. Now, the next thing to consider is that as part of the reaction, the um, reactants and products are probably almost certainly not going to have the same amount of potential energy. So the chemical bonds um, in the carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, if you add up all of that energy, it's not going to be the same as the energy of the products, carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Um, depending on the type of reaction, it's either those bonds are either gaining or losing energy. 
as we know um, from the uh, one of the, the second law of thermodynamics, I think, um, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transferred. So if um, these reactants um, gain or lose energy, they must be exchanging energy with the surroundings. So these diagrams, <laughs> These diagrams can tell us if the reaction is gaining or losing energy. So in this particular case, it looks like um, the reactants have more energy, they're higher up than the products. So um, in this case, the react, the chemical, there was stored potential chemical energy that was lost as part of the reaction. The way that means that it was released into the surroundings. This is usually released as heat. So if um, you have a reaction like this and you had it in some sort of, uh, these are gases, so you had it in like some sort of sealed vessel, the outside of the vessel would get hot or warm if you touched it because the reaction is releasing energy um, and you'd be able to notice it. So we call this um, the enthalpy. So go back up here. Um, the enthalpy is the change in energy. So it's the, um, Enthalpy, again, it's, it's kind of a weird concept. It's not heat and it's, it's energy, but it's a bit more complicated. But for our purposes, if you just think about it as kind of like heat or energy, but heat energy sort of, eh, it's a little complicated. But anyway, um, it's products minus the heat of the product, the, the, the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. So in this particular case, the energy of the products is lower than the energy of the reactants. So the delta H, um, or the change in enthalpy is, um, would be a negative number because it's a small number minus a bigger number is negative. So if that's true, we call this exothermic. So exo means like outside, um, endo means like inside. Yeah, I think that's true. And if it's not true, I'll think about it. Anyway, um, it means that heat's been, heat has been transferred outside. So the delta H is negative. Um, knowing if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic is extremely important. It is the, this is like the foundation of next unit, which is thermodynamics, which is like awesome. So it's good to start thinking about this. Endothermic is the opposite. So if we take a look at these two diagrams, these two potential energy diagrams are showing um, endothermic versus exothermic. So one of these is endothermic, one of them is exothermic. Um, maybe we'll label that in class. That could be kind of fun. Uh, but I think you can kind of figure it out. Okay. Um, one other thing I think on this note, on all of this, is that you can reverse reactions. And if you want to reverse a reaction, you can reverse the um, these diagrams, just flip them over. So like these are could be the same reaction, just in opposite directions. Um, and again, measuring the potential... Um, the, um, not potential energy, sorry, the activation energy is always um, the reactants, the difference between um, the transition state and reactants, um, which for here is a much smaller uh, activation energy, for here is a lot bigger. Um, and then, yeah, the delta H is products minus reactants. So endothermic, exothermic, important stuff. Okay, I think that's all we need for that one. On we go. Um, oh, yes, excellent. All right. So when you're working with a reaction, this is an important thing to talk about, is um, there, if you want to speed up a reaction, um, increasing the concentration of reactants is great. Increasing temperature also works. There's another option potentially is a catalyst, which is a substance that speeds up the reaction without being consumed. And what it does is it works by creating an alternate pathway or um, positioning atoms together or molecules or compounds or whatever together so that they can react with a lower activation energy. So if you think about um, the collision mod model was just showing random collisions. In an end, what a, a catalyst can do is um, create a situation where it's more likely to occur um, and you don't, without having to increase temperature. So there's three different types of catalysts. Um, there's a homogeneous, heterogeneous, and enzymes. So homogeneous catalysts are um, catalysts that are in the same phase of matter. So for example, in, in the atmosphere, we have ozone. There are catalysts in the atmosphere um, that um, will make the, de the, the decomposition of ozone into oxygen faster. Um, you will know a catalyst because it is 
um, not part of the chemical equation, the full chemical equation. It's it you it's exactly the same in the reactants as product. So it goes into the reaction and comes out identically. Um, in a mechanism, which we'll talk about later, a catalyst might show up, um, but it would kind of like cancel out. So like you'd see it as like a one of the first products, but it would also be or one of the first reactants, but it would also be a product. Um, it's not consumed by the reaction. That's the key. Um, a heterogeneous catalyst is in a different phase. So this is frequently like a piece, a solid piece of metal, like in a gas. And again, um, the re it aligns the reactants so they can form a product more easily. The third type is an enzyme, which is for biological purposes. If you take AP bio, that is like a huge topic. It's amazing, but they're extremely specific and they, uh, they allow biological reactions to happen um, when normally they would to happen at extremely, extremely slow rates. Um, and you can speed them up exponentially, like insanely sped up. Um, and they're also extremely specific so that the right reactions happen in the right places, which is very important for biological organisms. Um, in terms of these, pro these uh, the energy diagrams, um, the activation uh, using a catalyst lowers the activation energy. So this little dotted line is the catalyst. Different color pen, you know me, I like different color pens. Catalyst, that represents the catalyst. Catal, I can't spell, catalyst. So yeah, again, there's the activation energy has been lowered so that this reaction will happen with less energy. Okay, let's proceed. Um, factors, okay. So we said, I mentioned before that the concentration of reactants and the temperature are the two main factors that you can alter to um, increase the chances of successful collisions. Um, concentration is pretty straightforward. You increase the concentration, it will increase the rate. Now, how it increases the rate, the exact mathematical um, connection does matter and does vary based on the mechanisms. Um, and that's like a whole big part of the rest of the unit. But let's talk about temperature. Um, so Maxwell Boltzmann um, it, are these really great diagrams. They're two scientists. Um, I think it was the same guy, Maxwell, from the Maxwell equations, probably. Anyway, physics stuff. Um, when you are talking about um, the temperature of a reaction or of a substance, um, the temperature shows the average kinetic energy but it doesn't explain the actual kinetic energy of every individual molecule. So for example, if you have a reaction that, or water, for example, um, and it's at zero degrees Celsius, um, zero it means that that is the average speed. If you took all the kinetic, the speeds or kinetic energy of all of the atoms and averaged them, it would be at zero. But each individual atom is not, or, or molecule or whatever, is not exactly moving at that exact speed. Some are moving faster, some are moving slower. So this, um, these diagrams show that. So they show um, like a distribution, um, like these little bell curve kind of looking things. So at zero degrees Celsius, we can see this example here. Um, most of the molecules, this is number of particles. So most of the molecules like of water, for example, um, are um, at this particular level of energy, a relatively low one, but some are higher and some are lower. Um, and it's the area under the curve. So like kind of the length of that line that tells us what we need, how many are at that particular uh, energy level. If we increase the temperature, you'll notice some of the molecules are still moving very slowly. We increase it to 30 degrees Celsius because it's this curve now. Um, but uh, most of them are at a higher energy and some of them are even really high over here. If we increase the, this to 50, um, some of them are still, a very small number are still at a lower speed, but way more of them are at much higher energy levels. Um, so when it comes to a chemical reaction, this is actually very important because activation energy. So imagine that this is um, a chemical reaction that's occurring um, and it has a specific activation energy. This is the activation, EA activation energy. So the question is, 
will the reaction occur at different temperatures? So at zero degrees Celsius, we need the molecules to be moving this quickly. According to this, none of the molecules are moving that quickly, not even close. So there's no way that this reaction would, would occur. How about at 30 degrees? Well, at 30 degrees, most of them are way too, not moving anywhere near fast enough or don't have enough energy. But you know, a tiny little bit, let's highlight that, just a tiny, a small amount are. So, you know, it's possible maybe the reaction will happen, but just a little bit, very, very slowly, a few reactions will happen, but not a lot. But if we go up to 50 degrees Celsius, now we're talking um, a lot more are occurring, this whole thing, as opposed to just that tiny little, tiny little bit right there, okay? So this kind of explains why raising the temperature um, increases the rate. Not, the average does not have to be at the same level as the activation energy, just as long as more of the, um, of, uh, the particles are moving fast enough for the reaction to occur. Um, this can also explain why enzymes are useful. So this represents lowering the activation energy. So this is the um, ends activation energy with a cat catalyst, catalyst activation energy. So a catalyst um, decreases the amount of energy that's required. And now way more molecules are gonna be able to, and particles are moving fast enough. So like at 50 degrees, I mean, it's a ton more. Um, look at that difference right there. All those extra ones that are able to move. Um, even at 30 degrees, I think we would actually get to start seeing this reaction occur as opposed to before. There's a lot more that are actually happening. Um, so it's good to be able to analyze these diagrams. Okay, another way of looking at it, there's lots of different graphs, two, two that we've gone over so far. All right, let's talk about mechanisms. This is going to get funky, but it's going to be awesome. So um, mechanisms, uh, basically reactions happen in a series of steps, and a chemical equation is a summary of all of those elementary steps. An elementary step is a single um, step with one mechanism that's occurring. Um, they have um, something called a molecularity, which is like how many of those molecules are involved. So um, we'll go more into that. We'll come back to it, but it's a whole thing. Um, and we can use this to write rate laws, but again, you don't know what a rate law is yet. So let's keep going. Um, so let's take a look at a few things here. So a mechanism is a series of elementary steps that explains a whole reaction. There's a couple rules about them. Um, first of all, a mechanism is always proposed based on experiments. So if a, a scientist, um, a chemist is trying to figure out the mechanism of a reaction and they're studying this particular reaction, um, they would do a whole bunch of experiments, which we're actually gonna look at experimental data um, that you would gather um, and kind of figure out um, uh, like the rate law, which again, we'll talk about later. They figure out the rate law. Um, then they can come up with something a mechanism where all of the steps have to add up to the chemical equation. So if there's any intermediaries, they all have to cancel, which we'll talk about in a second, intermediaries. Um, oh, I didn't underline or bold that. Normally I would have underlined that word. Um, so, um, and the um, rate law, the slowest step or the, the rate determining step has to agree with the data. So, um, an intermediate, uh, let's take a look at this example and we can go back and show you all of the steps. So this is a chemical reaction that someone might be studying. So nitrogen monoxide and oxygen um, or ozone uh, form, sorry, I gotta move this out of the way. Um, nitrogen dioxide and, and uh, like di uh, diatomic uh, oxygen, it's all gases. So here's the mechanism. What they are suggesting here is that um, it's not, this is the summary of the mechanism. Um, and that the mechanism is two steps, two steps. The first one is one uh, nitrogen monoxide collides with one um, um, ozone to create nitrogen tri uh, trioxide and a single molecular oxygen. 
this is a pretty slow step. Um, so this is like this relative rate. We don't know what the rate is, but it doesn't really matter. It's just slow, which makes sense. Because if you think back to like formal charges and like if you had to draw um, a uh, Lewis diagram for this, like it's going to be a weird one. This is clearly way more stable than this. So that's going to happen kind of slowly. But as soon as it does, and the two those two um, species will bump into each other again and then create the nitrogen dioxide and the oxygen. So it's kind of like probably something like, let me just try to think if I should, if there's a way I can draw that, that'll be more interesting with some colors or something. Eh, I'll think about it. Maybe later, we'll go back. So um, the, these are the two steps. These are both in, um, elementary steps. In terms of their molecularity, um, this one has one nitrogen uh, monoxide and one oxygen or uh, um, ozone. So the molecularity would be, it's gonna be um, a bimolecular and cause it's an, uh, oops, bimolecular cause there's an A and a B. There's two different molecules, but they're different chemical species. Um, the second step is also bimolecular but it's just two different chemical species. So in terms of intermediaries, um, intermediaries are things that are produced as part of the reaction but don't last very long. They're produced and immediately consumed, which in this case would be the nitrogen trioxide and the elemental oxygen. So um, they kind of cancel out. So one thing that we can do with this, um, this, uh, these types of mechanisms is you can actually add, um, um, you can add the two reactions together and cancel them out. So if we were to kind of like add these two together, these would both cancel because they're on the same on both sides. And we could add them together, which is equal to our original equation. So that works. So in this particular case, yeah, NO3 and O are intermediates. Intermediates. Intermediate or intermediate, yeah, intermediates or intermediaries. All right, um, the rate determining step is the step, um, the slowest step. So this would be the rate determining step. Rate determining step. Um, and you can use that to write the, 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 the rate law. So what this kind of is telling us is that um, in, the, 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 the second step doesn't actually, whoo, the, 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 that's all folks. Um, man, uh, the rate determining step is the slow one. So um, if we increase the concentration of nitrogen monoxide or, and or uh, ozone, this step is gonna go faster. So it'll speed up the whole reaction. If for some reason we had nitrogen trioxide just lying around and we added more nitrogen trioxide, it's not gonna speed up the reaction um, because this is already a very fast reaction anyway. So um, I think we need to talk about rate laws and then we can kind of come back and explain how this relates to rate laws. So we're going to skip um, the steady state approximation, but we will come back to that. This is where things get circular and weird. And we're just getting to the border of it, but I think it'll make sense in just a minute. Okay, rate laws. So Um, a rate law is the, an equation um, that shows how the effect of a concentration of reactants on a rate at a specific temperature. So it kind of, it again, connects like this idea of rate and concentration, time, all of that. Uh, products are not included. Um, there's going to be a couple of uh, parts to a rate law. One of them is a constant and one is the orders, which we're going to, orders of reactions, which we're going to go into. Um, and they have to be determined experimentally. You cannot look at a chemical, the molar ratios of a chemical reaction and know, um, be able to determine the rate law based on that. You have to have experimental data first. So let's talk about order. So order of reactants is um, this relationship between the concentration of a reactant and the effect on rate. So it makes sense generally to say that if we increase 
the concentration of a reactant, the rate will increase. But the question is, how much? How much of an effect is it going to have? So generally speaking, we have three choices, um, and it's zero, first, and second order. So if something is zero order, it has no effect on the reaction rate. So even if you increase the re that particular reactant, the rate doesn't change. That is one possibility. The next possibility is it's first order, and it's a linear effect. So um, it's like if you doubled the concentration and the rate doubled, that would be a linear effect. If you tripled the concentration and the rate tripled, that's a linear effect. Second order is more of an exponential effect. So if you double the concentration of a reactant and it's a second order reactant, um, then the, con the rate would quadruple. Or if you tripled um, the, um, the concentration, like you do two experiments and you triple, um, the rate would um, multiply by nine, a factor of nine. So the way you can kind of think about this, it's like exponents. So let's do this here real quick. If you have, let's just say, I don't know, pick a number. Um, if you have like uh, two and you raise it to the zero power, that's the zero order, you're just going to have one. So there's no real connection. Hold on a second. Um, if you take three and you raise it to the zero order, it's still just one. There's no connection between these two things. If it's first order, that's like raising it to the first power. So two to the one is two. Three to the one is three. And if you raise it to the second order, second power, uh, two to the two is four, and two to the three is isn't that eight? Yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah, it is eight. Okay. So that's what order really means. It's like, what, what power are you raising something to? So it all might have some, some connection, but it's just some of it's going to be stronger than others. So order is important. And when we go, we can go back to mechanisms for just a second. Um, usually determining order is the important thing when you're trying to write a rate law. So you can use a mechanism. The slow step is going to tell you the order of the reactants. So whatever a reactants appear and their molar ratios um, is the order. So what that would suggest for us here is that nitrogen monoxide and ozone, because they're both appear in the slow step um, and they only appear once, they're both first order reactants. We'll revisit it, but just to start thinking. Okay. So um, let's talk about, there's two different ways to write a couple of different ways to write rate laws. Um, and again, this is like, it's an, it's a, it's an equation. Um, it's kind of like a slope of a line equation is basically how it's put together, um, relating two different variables to each other, kind of a Y equals MX plus B kind of thing. Um, uh, based on what yeah variables you're, you're calculating um, between rate, time, and um, concentration of reactants or the three factors, you pick two out of three. Um, there's the integrated rate law. And there's also the differential rate law. Um, these are related to calculus. We are not going to be doing calculus, um, but we can kind of do some cheats. And once you understand calculus someday in the future, this will make way more sense. Um, the integrated rate law shows up a little bit. There's a few things we have to do with it. We're going to do a lab that kind of in, that uses it a little bit, um, but it's a little trickier. The differential is much more like what we're going to use more times, but we do have to do both. So the integrated rate law, we'll start there, is expressing um, reactant concentration and time. Those are our variables. So time is going to be like our, um, that's our X and reactant concentration is our Y, okay? It can only express one reactant at a time. So if we were trying to use, um, do the integrated rate law for this equation, we could, but it's really tricky. So we're not likely to do so. Um, however, if we wanted to do the integrated rate law for this equation, pretty easy. There's only one reactant. So that works out just fine. So decompositions are pretty good for this. Um, we determine the order of the reaction. Um, you can, basically we can analyze Okay, come back here. Let's go back to order for just a second, sorry. The order of a reaction is based off of the mechanism. 
we can discover the order of reaction based on experimental data. Once we know the order of a, sorry, reactant, once we know the order of a reactant, how it affects the rate, that's just true. Once we know it, it doesn't matter if we're talking integrated rate law, differential rate law mechanism, doesn't matter. That is like the experimentally determined fact. We as scientists or chemists are now trying to go backwards to figure out why is that the case? And that's what mechanisms are all about. So we start with experiment to determine what is the truth of the situation of this reaction? How do these reactants interact with each other? Um, the rates are like the evidence, and then we can go back and try to figure out um, the actual mechanisms and what's happening. So, um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> just lost myself there for a second. Okay, so um, the order of reaction, we can use the data. Um, integrated rate law versus differential rate law is just taking data and using it in different types of data and using it differently to determine the order and then like all these other details of the, of the reaction. So let's just keep going and I think it'll make sense. Okay, so whew, this information is um, connected to these integrated rate laws. So um, there's three different orders and they're all, a lot of this information is actually on your yellow sheet, not all of it, but it is kind of hidden here. Um, if you look under kinetics, it's right here. Um, this equation and this equation and this equation, you're going to see all three of those are here. I'm just going to underline them because they're all on your sheet. Um, this one is not, but this one is. And so is this. And so is this. So it's just good to know that they exist. These are the equations um, that um, you can get based on um, concentration versus time. So the way that we determine the rate law is based on the order of the reaction. And these are the different options that you have. Um, if it's a zero order reactant, you have this equation. If it's a first order reactant, you have this one. And um, this one is for a second order reaction. Again, if you know calculus, this would make a lot of sense. This is like the first integral and the second integral. Anyway. Um, this equation might look sort of familiar. This is basically y equals mx plus b. But what it actually stands for is the concentration. Um, the two variables that you're kind of interested in are um, the y and the x. So there's concentration and time. Um, M is your slope of a line and B is your initial concentration. It's like your, your uh, Y intercept, which is your initial concentration of the, the reactant. Um, so let's just dive right in and I'll, I'll explain it. And I might have to explain it multiple times, but that's okay. So um, the way that you, we do this is, um, let's look at some data and I'll, I'll go through it. So here's our reaction. We've got um, the, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide, there's two of them and they're reacting to form our nitrogen dioxide and our oxygen. Um, this is experimental data. Experimental data. Experimental data. Experimental data. And we take this data and we're going to try to analyze it and try to figure out what the heck is going on here. Our goal here is to figure out is nit dinitrogen um, pentoxide a first, a zero first, second or order reactant? Once we know that, how does it actually relate? Um, if we change the concentration of uh, dinitrogen pentoxide, uh, what effect will it have on the rate? And once we know that, we can kind of figure out which equation is appropriate. So our, again, our goal here is we want to determine it's one of these three, this one, this one, or this one, is the um, rate law. Um, which is just an, a weird fancy word for an equation. Um, it's not going to be more than one. It's just going to be one. We have to just figure out which one it is. So the way that we do this is we um, take the data and we graph it. So the graph is going to be um, always time as our X variable. So we've got three. I, I ended up, what I did was I actually went into Excel and I made all three of these graphs and I'll show you guys how I do it. It's, it's not that hard and it's really fun to know how to do use Excel. So um, this is the, uh, the time 
and this is the concentration of um, uh, of our our uh, reactant. So this graph here represents. Um, it's a little harder to see here, but I'll write it in. This is just the concentration versus time. So it's just this data just graphed. And what we're looking for is we want to see, um, we're looking for a linear relationship or a straight line. Um, this, if this were a zero, yeah, there's three different choices. There is um, the concentration of the reactant versus time the natural log of the concentration of reactant versus time and the inverse of the reactant versus time. Whichever one of these has a straight line, that's the order. So going back here for a second, for a zero order reactant, that line, concentration versus time, will be a straight line. If it's not a zero order reactant, this will not have a straight line, which it doesn't here. For a first order reactant, um, the time versus the natural log of the concentration will be a straight line. For a second order, it'll be the inverse. So this one is, um, what, I, what I did for this one was I just, yeah, I just graphed it. Not a straight line, so I kind of kept trying something else. The next thing I did was I took all of this data and I did the natural log of all of those numbers and then I graphed that. So this one, again, you might not be able to see it. This is the natural log of that data versus time. This one has a straight line. Because I doing this, um, because, it, because this relationship is a straight line, this determines that this is a first order reactant. So we know that nitrogen um, dioxide in this reaction is a first order reactant. Meaning that if we double the amount of, of dinitrogen pentoxide, it will double the rate. If we cut it in half, it will cut it in half. This one over here is the inverse. So again, this is one over the concentration of N2O5. And this one is not a straight line, so it's not um, second order. So this, this, represents, um, this represents first uh, zero order, that's first. And then this one is um, second order. And basically, whenever you see problems like this, they're going to show you all three graphs, or you have to make all three graphs. Whichever one's the straight line, that's how you know what order it is. And again, it's based off of the, the, the y value, so what math was done to it. This one, we didn't do any mathematical operations to the raw data. This one, we did natural log, which is like a log, but with something I can't remember. It's like base e or some weird weirdness like that. This one's the inverse. You just flip it over, invert it. Um, so in this particular case, we were able to determine that this is first order. Um, to kind of help you remember this, it's a little tricky. Um, the actual yellow sheet puts them in order. It doesn't include zero order, but this is the first order. That's the second order. And you can see that the concentrations have a natural log versus an inverse. So that's a little trick. First order, second order. So natural log, first order. That's pretty much it. Um, it's kind of a weird, I always have a hard time describing it, but it really is that simple. Um, so yeah, whichever one has that, 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 um, that relationship. So if we are going to write um, the um, rate law for this reaction, the rate law, um, oh, sorry, this data proves to us that this is a first order reactant. There's a two in front of it, doesn't matter. That makes no difference. Just because of the two there, this is not the mechanism. The mechanism must be somehow different so that this is not the case. Um, do I have an example of that? Hold on, I just want to go back real quick. Uh, I do, but we have, we'll cover it later. Okay, so if we're going to write the rate law for this reaction, we just have to go up here or go onto our yellow sheet, and that is going to be the rate law. So the rate law is whatever the natural log of N2, the concentration of that is, that is going to be equal to um, negative k um, times time um, plus the natural log of the initial rate um, of, uh, of the concentration. In our case, the initial rate was 0.1, so it's going to be the ln of 0 0.1, which we could actually calculate if we wanted, Okay, because that's the initial initial rate. 
initial concentration, sorry. Okay, that's a initial concentration. Okay, so um, the K, K is a constant. Um, this is kind of like your, your M slope kind of value. In this case, it actually, in fact, is the slope. If you notice, this looks kind of like Y equals MX plus B. So you would find the slope of this line, which I let my calculator do it for me. Um, and it looks like it is, I let my computer do it for me. It's negative uh, 0 0.0059. So I'm gonna take that and it's actually negative. So the actual working equation What's the ln of 0.1? I'm gonna figure that out. You probably won't have to do this, but it's just nice to have it anyway. I just did it in my calculator. It's actually a negative number, so it's negative 2.3. Okay, so this is our rate law. Kind of cool. Okay, um, so it's a, again, it connects um, the concentration of our reactant with time. So those are the two factors that you're kind of playing with. Um, this reaction happened at a specific temperature. If we change the temperature, the K is gonna change. Um, and so other things might as well, but the K is the main thing that's gonna change. Um, it's still a first order reactant. We just know that now. Um, this data has proven to us that in this reaction, doesn't matter as long as this is the reaction, it is a first order reactant. Um, doubling the amount of nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen pentoxide will double the rate. Having it will have the rate. So that's the relationship that they have. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause or stop here. Um, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to make a second video just because I think the a fire alarm is about to go off and also I could use like a quick break. Um, and we're going to continue on talking about half-life and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. So here we go. Oops. <laughs>